Professor Said Hassan Nasser, Professor of Islamic Studies at George Washington University, an important Muslim intellectual, important Muslim leader, head of an important Sufi group, uh, Iranian by origin, living in the United States now for decades and decades. Thank you for making time to be with us for this uh, interview as part of our Corona Inspection series. I'm very grateful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's a pleasure to be able to be with you for a few minutes. Inshallah will be more than a few minutes, but in God's time, yeah. Um, so what, is this Corona affecting you in any significant way or for you it's business as usual? Uh, no, here it's not business as usual. I teach my classes through Skype and most people are sequestered and uh, the university is closed. Uh, so it's a difficult situation. But nothing that Zoom can't solve. Nothing what? That Zoom can't solve. Uh, <laughs> only God can solve it. Only God can solve it. So let's talk. Let's talk about God. Let's talk about God and coronavirus. Let's make that the focus, because coronavirus has us all scared, and ultimately the answer to all our the answer to all our worries and everything is is God. So let's make that the focus of today's conversation. So let's begin with this whole with what I just said. Now people are scared. There's fear in the air, there's anxiety, there's even panic. What divine medicine can we offer people? What can you offer from your uh, Shia perspective, from your Sufi perspective, from your broader Islamic perspective? What can you offer that will help people cope with their fear and anxiety? Uh, first of all, people who are people of faith, whether it be Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, doesn't matter, the Asian is on or her own language. Uh, we belong to a tradition in which uh, calamities in this world are always seen as signs of uh, God's either punishment of our actions or warning or a bell to awaken us. The Quran is replete with many references that uh, we should learn from calamities, the passing nature of the world, the brittleness of the land upon which we stand, the uh, intransigence, uh, the transience of uh, wealth, power, and so forth, and to bring to us our souls an aspect of humility. Uh, Great tragedies were seen, whether there were earthquakes or plagues or things like that, by all traditional people in the world, from the West to China, before modernism came, as uh, signs that brought people to their senses, and therefore, in a sense, as a form of grace. As a form of grace. Uh, many of the prophets of the Old Testament, your own prophets, which we must have shared with with you, uh, their function was precisely to scare people in a sense, uh, but not in a negative way. It's, uh, I'm reminded of the famous saying of Ghazali, the great uh, Muslim theologian and Sufi, who said uh, the difference between God and man is that when you're afraid of a man, you run away from him. We are afraid of God, you run towards Him. And uh, so the fear that ordinary people have when the world around them, what they identify as reality, begins to shake, uh, that fear can be positive by turning them to the reality which is abiding, and for which, for his realization, we were here. We are here on earth, we're put here on earth by God. So, uh, you really said a lot. First of all, I, I'm very struck by how similar what you're saying is to what uh, one Hasidic rabbi that I interviewed, Rabbi Kenick, said. He quoted the exact same notion, I run, I flee from you to you. So, the, 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 fear, the, 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 the fear and the flight is exactly returning back to, uh, back to God. So it's an invitation, but you also suggested it as a punishment and a sign of 
of things to come? Do you think what we're experiencing is a punishment or just a wake-up call? How do you see the COVID-19 situation? This is a very complicated matter. Uh, definitely, uh, it is a punishment from a theological point of view in the sense that a modern man wants to live happily in forgetfulness of God. He thinks it is right to live happily in forgetfulness of God. From a religious point of view, this is absurd because he has not created the reality of his life or th that the world around him or all the values that it cherishes. And uh, he is not the creator. He is, uh, no matter how strong he feels that uh, he can do this, he can do that, uh, he's not. And this, such an uh, event as the coronavirus is a very good way of reminding us of that. Look at, the, look at all the science, all these hospitals, all this biology, all this uh, chemistry, and all that goes on, and the hubris that modern man has of being able to solve everything. And then a little bug, uh, millions of a millimeter or whatever it is, comes along and upsets the whole order. Also, uh, it's very important to realize, ordinary people are not aware of it, but for those who have studied the philosophy of modern science, they know that uh, without prediction, there's no physics. When I was studying physics at MIT, a professor always would tell us that uh, if physics cannot predict an event, it's not physics, it's not science. Uh, and so, suddenly, we're slapped in the face with all these sciences, with the worship of modern science and all the technologies and so forth. Suddenly, something occurs that nobody predicted and so powerful that it has made us, such powerful human beings, afraid and weakened and retreating into a corner. Finally, we'll be able to, I believe, overcome this because I don't think God wants this to come to an end. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, that this is an event that will pass away, inshallah. But as we say, as you are, ohala, as they say in Latin, um, so you have in Hebrew also, uh, it will pass away. But nevertheless, a very important lesson to learn of not self aggrandizing, of this attitude that we have that we own the earth, we can do with it whatever we want, it, uh, nobody has any right over us, and so on and so on. So uh, I'm hoping that despite the pains that uh, this is causing, despite the large number of deaths, will also be an occasion for a spiritual revival, at least for those who are intelligent enough to understand that all the claims made by modern science and technology are really not true. They're very, of course, they can, science can do a lot of things. I'm not saying that they can't, but it is not all knowing, not all knowing at all. And the trust that you and I, not now, but our ancestors, or if you and I had lived in the Middle Ages, had in God, in the rabbis, in the ulama, in the representative religion, all of which transferred to modern scientists and physicians and so on and so on. But that trust was really not to be do, uh, to, correct to do so. We trusted our religious leaders because we believed they had an authority which ultimately came from God. Then began to trust modern science and technology. You and I ride an elevator in New York goes up to 80th floor. The trusting the technology somebody has created that is going to bring us down five, two minutes, 80 floors down to the street, or many other things, get into an airplane and things like that. This trust was have transferred to modern science and technology. It had some positive effects. I'm not saying it hasn't, but it also been very, very negative in the sense that we have over-trusted only a particular part of our soul and of our mind, disregarding the rest disregarding the rest. And even now, for example, this separation of not being close to people is, is a remarkable thing.
it's like forcing her to make a spiritual retreat in Sufism when a person wants to enter the spiritual path is put by the master in a retreat, Khalwa, we call Khalwa in Arabic and Arabic, uh, in a room by himself. Uh, you also had in the Hasidic movement in the Kabbalah, you're in Jewish Muslim. To just be with God alone. And this aloneness, separated from interaction with others, allowed the soul to concentrate and come to within itself, to draw inwardly where God resides. And this is uh, being done sort of by force upon many of us. So uh, I'm hoping that may, many of us at least will learn a lesson from it. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you for that uh, introductory statement, which is, which is quite potent. Let me, let me share a thought that I struggle with, and I know many people will struggle with, and I know that we'll also be, some people will have a hard time receiving what you're saying for the following reason. Let's look at the Jewish community. The Jewish community is very hard hit, both in New York and in Israel. And the parts of the community that are hardest hit are the most religious. So how is it that if this virus is there to teach us not to forget God, it's hitting the people who are the least technological, the least scientific, and ostensibly the most religious. Something is going wrong if the lesson of COVID-19 is to teach us not to rely on ourselves, the wrong people are getting punished. Uh, this is a very important question, theologically also, uh, and it's very difficult to answer. Uh, if you, I don't want to make an ex cathedra statement that the answer of Islam is, I don't dare to, but my own uh, answer would be as an individual who's tried to study religion and tried to live as a religious person, as a Muslim, that is to go back to uh, a saying uh, of uh, the Prophet of Islam that him whom God loves most, he tries most. That is, the trials of life are carried out more for people of faith than people have no faith because, in a sense, it prepares them for paradise. Whereas those who do not undergo these trials, uh, well, inshallah, they will change their ways. We don't want anyone to be damned, but are damning themselves. That is, in a sense, the permission by God to those whose nature has turned against God to remain forgetful. The Quran has a verse like that, that uh, those who have gone astray, we allow them to follow their own way, let them, let, let them go their own way. And so uh, uh, it's very interesting that you have in a place like Brooklyn, where you have a number of very pious Jews who are very precious to the Jewish community and to religious life itself in this country, having a higher lo uh, loss in this tragedy than people living on 17th Street on Madison Avenue in, in Manhattan. But that, that would be my understanding of it. Uh, and we see that oftentimes in human history. In human history, and the Quran has, a ver as I said several times, verses which refer exactly to this issue. Let's go back to the question of the of the khilwa of the of the recluse. Uh, of the what? The, the, the khalwa. Khalwa. Sorry, the khalwa. Yes. Um, You're very intimately familiar with the Sufi tradition. So how does exactly it work that you going into this seclusion as a preparation for the spiritual life? At that time when you're going inwards in that training, are you supposed to be concentrating on God, on your imperfections, on the relationship with society at large? Do you remember society or do you forget society? Or differently put, what is the relationship between this going inward and this forced solitude and a sense of solidarity and connectedness to the rest of society and the world? That's a very important question. We are born alone and we die alone. Can I deny that? Uh, going into a spiritual retreat is, in a sense, a practice of death. 
have to be alone with God. The Prophet said in a very enigmatic statement, die before you die. So you do not die when you die. Mutu qabla an tamutu in Arabic. This is in Arabic according for you. Mutu qabla an tamutu. Uh, and you have spiritual death, certainly in Kabbalah, you have it in Christianity, it's a universal idea that is to die to the world, to die to the world and to your own nafs, to your own lower carnal soul. That's what you're supposed to be doing in the khalwa. That is, leave the world aside. You close the door, leave the world out there. Don't think of a relation to society, to your mother, to your father, to anything. Just your direct relation with the spiritual reality as God that is both transcendent and imminent within yourself. And once, once through that practice, your inner soul is nurtured by the divine presence. Then you come out, and the perfections gained through the spiritual practice that you try to then use in your relation with your family, with the society, and so forth and so on. The khalwa is not for social service, but it renders the greatest social service by turning the soul of man from self-interest, from uh, scatteredness, from pride, to be God, to being God-centered. That's what, what all the prophets did. Christ went into the desert for 40 days. The prophet used, of Islam used to go to retreats. Moses went on top of Mount Sinai. Why didn't they receive the, the Ten Commandments in the middle of the Jewish people sitting by the Red Sea? It's a very, very important question. He received a loan from God. But then he brought it down and changed the life of all people for thousands of years. People still live by 3,000 years later on. So you can't say Moses was selfish, he was not thinking of his people, he was only thinking of himself. That's not correct. To think of your relation with God is not to be selfish at all. It's to be selfless. If you take nafsh, nafsh in Hebrew, nafs in Arabic, it's to transcend the nafs. And once you do that, then your soul is able to be fed by the divine reality in such a way that it always goes beyond its own boundaries. And that's what charity is, love of the other is, service to the other is. You go beyond the boundary, the border of your own soul. If you go and, uh, let's say, spend your money uh, buying a dress for yourself or your wife, if it insists your wife is still with the confine of your soul, but when you give, ithar, when you give without any expectation, then you're really being charitable. And that will come by, at first, cutting yourself from all that attaches you to outwardness, to worldliness, to pride, and trying to cut yourself from the world, to be with God, and therefore uh, to follow what uh, Sidna Isa said uh, to be in the world but not of the world. That is, you cut off the of the worldness to be with God, and then you come back into the world but with God, and therefore whatever you do is selfless. That's what the real good person is. If you are good because you want to get rich or famous, or because my your father will be happy, or family name will be more famous in Jerusalem or Tehran. That is not real goodness. The goodness, real goodness is that which gives of itself. It's just nothing. The recompense of a good act is the good act itself, in the deepest sense. Again, there's a Kabbalistic saying that all the profound things that anybody can say, you can find in the Kabbalah. So you know, all of these are known to you. I know, but uh, right now, we're, we're, we're listening to the, to, the, to the Muslim angle of that one truth. So. I trust that it exists in other places as well, and, and we're grateful to you for sharing the Muslim side of it. So let's, let's apply this teaching then to the people who are being forced into seclusion. What I hear you saying is, don't spend your time trying to recreate life on the outside on Zoom and on TV. Use it for something else. So what instruction or recommendation would you actually tell people 
who are now being forced to stay inwards in a situation of lockdown, in a situation of, of uh, what they call social distancing. What, if we take everything you've just told us, how would you recommend that they live this period? Uh, first of all, you cannot make an abrupt rupture immediately for everyone. There are people who are still in need of talking to others or watching a program on television, something like that. And you cannot say, don't talk on the telephone to anybody, don't watch any television program and so forth. What you can advise people to do is to spend, uh, since you have a lot of time in your hand, to spend it more with yourself, to get to know yourself, to be happy being with yourself. I always tell, give this example to my students. If you're driving in a countryside, in let's say Afghanistan or Iran or some faraway place in, in the Islamic world, you oftentimes see a man or woman sitting by the road waiting for a bus or something like that. For three hours, sitting like this, look at the horizon. A person near your subway would go mad if he did that. You always have to have external stimuli. Uh, now I have earphones, uh, this and that, sounds and noises and so forth and so on. It's a very good time to bring down the decibel of the inner noise, to gradually learn to know each other, to be happy with our, with our inner being, not to always flee externally. It's the nature of modern societies to make everyone an extrovert trying to always go out, always go out. Yes, sometimes you have to go out, but also to l learn how to live within. And that can be done by force. I remember I had a friend in Iran many, many years ago. He was a, a turban person with mullah, but very learned and very good person. He was in prison for some lecture or something like that. And when I went into prison, of course, I was very, very unhappy of the, of the act activities seized. And he got in touch with me. And I, so I sent him a copy of the Mastavi of Jalaluddin Rumi. I said the time for me to read this. I said, don't read this as a novel. Read this piece by piece and try to meditate upon it and draw inwardly with its meaning. Four months later, he wanted to, they told him to can go out of jail. He didn't want to come out. When he came out, he said, I was so happy I rediscovered my inner self. And he was a mullah, but I thought used always the external activity, externalization. And to, so this occasion should be a kind of uh, favorable, not uh, a completely negative period for us to learn some silence. We live in too, too much of a cacophonic world. It decreased the cacophony. I'm not saying that I said no television, no radio, no music, and so on. No, but di diminish that. Be some hours with yourself. And that will, I think, help all of us. Help all of us. That's very wise counsel. So, uh, well, there's one practical advice I hear you giving people is read Rumi. That's one, one way to get through this uh, particular period is read Rumi. But maybe you could give us some more pointers. How does a person learn to be with themselves? If you didn't grow up in Afghanistan and you're not used to sitting for three hours gazing at the horizon and you're used to the hectic outward extrovert life and you're faced with this new situation and you're not a meditator or whatever, what pointers could you suggest to someone as they start to befriend the, the part of themselves they're not used to being with? That's a very good question. First of all, most people lack the power of concentration. They cannot concentrate even for 30 seconds on anything. I said, I hold my finger in front of my student. I said, how many of you can concentrate on the finger that's right in front of you for one minute? After about 20 seconds, your mind begins to wander off about where you park your car, where you're going to have for lunch, when you're going to call your boyfriend and so forth, and a girlfriend or whatever. It is. Uh, this is a difficult thing. And uh, what we have to do is uh, for, for people who have not been trained to meditate and so forth, and uh, is if you're not religious, it makes it much more difficult. 
But see, a religious, my advice would be always to pray to God to help you in this process. And that's very, very effective, very, very effective. But anyway, for those who cannot do so, you, if, when you sit down and either close your eyes or open your eyes in the corner of a room and do, do nothing externally, what happens is that the imaginative faculty in your mind streak very rapidly in, in your head. One image after another, one thought of another, after another comes into your mind. And that's why you get bored after a while. And uh, everybody needs this external stimulus. And this external stimulus is not there. My advice to people is to try to at least think of something that you like. Either think or imagine the imaginal faculty because of two different possibilities in our mind. One is abstract thought, one is uh, imagination that is based on form. Uh, try to imagine or think of something positive that you like and to, to try to concentrate on that rather than having your mind just go all over the place and you get, get tired and get fidgety. You don't know what to do with yourself. You get up and walk in the room. You want to hit your head against the wall and so forth and so on. Try to give your mind preoccupied, which my mind needs to be preoccupied, except for saints. Or, uh, or the Buddhists talk about emptiness, to have your mind empty. That's a very difficult thing. We, we need to think. We are thinking beings. Try to think of something which is positive and which at the same time you like, and gradually try to, to bridle, to control the mind in this way. Uh, is this a subject in which one cannot give advice on television to everybody? Because it's really individual more in the, uh, than is should be tailor made for each individual. Because individual souls are very very different, and I do not want to give advice. Everybody take aspirin at seven o'clock in the morning, because and uh, all doctors would do. Each patient, each person, needs his or her own medicine. That's very that's very wise. I think that's the fruit of decades of experience and decades of spiritual guidance. That you've been giving to people so you know exactly how, how it works and how it has to be uh, tailor-made. Going then back into the space that we're, we're alone, um, how can we feel in that space solidarity for others? How can you what? How can we feel solidarity for others in that space when we are, when we are uh, confined to our, own, to our own space due to the situation? Uh, by, if you delve deeply enough into your soul, you realize that the other is none other than myself. Mm. That is, you almost feel, feel a bond with the inner being of others. Even uh, outwardly, they're different from you. They're, they're, you don't have to like everybody on the psychophysical level. But the inner being inner being of the other is ultimately nothing other than ourselves. And one of the very important positive products of this being alone, to be alone in a sense, you're never alone but completely, where God is always there. But whether you realize it or not, whether you're a religious person or not, but being alone is gradually, if you delve more and more into yourself, is to realize that in a sense, you are never alone. There's one self with a capital S, which is the center of all of our beings. And wow. so it has a very important social aspect to it also. So Professor Nasser, we're continuing in segment two. A few days later, having gotten some rest, we look, there's more, there's more light in both our faces. There's more smile on both our faces. Hopefully the world is doing better. And yet, people are suffering. People have lost a lot. The whole corona situation has brought about a lot of deprivation of freedom, of habits, of money, of life. How to deal with loss? Uh, you, in a sense, ask, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of God, let me begin. Uh, you, in a sense, ask me this question before, but let me elaborate and elucidate on that. That's a very large question. You could speak hours about it. First of all, uh, there is no human life 
without gain and there's no human life without loss. If a human life would have to have uh, no gain, you would not even gain weight. As a baby, you would never grow up. Just start with the physical <laughs> way, uh, gain. And many other things. And if there were no, no loss, uh, we would not really realize, realize that uh, we are not made for this world alone. That is, we are journeyers in this world. What makes reminds human beings that being on a journey is precisely the passage of the scenery around them, the conditions around them, and uh, some things are beautiful, some things are ugly, you look out of the window, whether they're riding on a train or a bus or a car, or wherever it is, or walking and uh, running, wherever it is. And uh, the loss also is part and parcel of human life. It's a, if you look at it spiritually, it's a gift from God to make us realize First of all, that things in this world which we believe belong to us really don't belong to us. They're alone to us. Starting with our life, we didn't create ourselves. The fact that you can see into my eyes, you did not invent that power. This is for people like you and I who believe in God, they believe it's a God-given gift for those who believe in other forms of philosophy. We will get into that now. But anyway, you, it's not individual. All, everybody would agree that the individual does not create everything that he has. And loss is a way of reminding us of that. And so loss can also be a form of freedom. I don't usually like too much to talk about my own experiences uh, in the spiritual matters, but this one I think would be interesting for uh, you and for those who are going to listen to this program. In 1978, I lived in Iran, Persia. I was one of the highest jobs in the country. I was very well off from a very well known family. I had everything, everything. On January 6th, I took a plane to come to London in order to go from there to Tokyo to a, a inaugural exhibition of Persian art, which I did not do because the uh, exhibition was cancelled by Fukuda and the Prime Minister of Japan and so forth. We won't get into that. So, uh, when I came to the airport, in Tehran airport, all of the generals, including General Noruzi, who was later on executed when the revolution took place, would salute me because of the very high rank I had in the country, and my car drove right to the plane. We did. I went through the royal pavilion. Nobody even looked at my passport. They were treated royally, literally royally. Get into the plane. I get off at the Heath Arrow. I'm a nobody. In six hours, in six hours, everything is lost. I didn't know I was going to lose my house and my property and my library and so on. Then with the blood that. But all the power I had, the source of money, all of these things just disappeared in, in a few hours. And I came and uh, uh, our hotel was near the Central Park of London, Hyde Park. I came at the top of, uh, we walked down, to walk down Oxford Street, which is one of the crowded streets of London. And I looked around and I was surprised that nobody knows me. In Tehran, I couldn't walk in the street without people saying, Salam, Salam Alaikum, how are you? wanting this, mind that. I, I, I'm free. I'm free. And suddenly it dawned on me that this tremendous loss, which I hope you will never, never suffer, which I hope no one suffered, tremendous, all my life, my writings, my library, my family inheritance, everything did, but in one day. But this loss also gave me such freedom. So loss in life should be seen by us not only in its negative painful aspect of course it's painful but it also if you learn the right lesson from it would bring to us a sense of freedom as always a positive aspect to it as long as we know that the one thing that if you have faith we shall never lose is god if you preserve that rope in our hand the rope of faith the Hablul Mateen, as the Quran says, the strong cable, 
the word cable in English comes from the Arabic habla, which is the same word really. They cling to the cable, strong cable of our relations to God. Don't cling to that. All laws, I think, can be also seen as a gift. And the kind of something that freezes us inwardly. It's because most of the laws in life are laws that are fetters that bind us to the transient, to the worldly, to the selfish. And one hopes that when tragedies come, like try to come here, it would make at least some people become less selfish, become more selfless, not lose that uh, very strong domination that uh, our lower passions, carnal soul, has over our immortal substance, over our immortal spirit. It's very clear. It's. Uh... I ask myself as I listen to you, do you have to be an advanced philosopher, an advanced Sufi master to be able to live it? Or can ordinary common people really live this, especially if they haven't cultivated spirituality? Uh, there is a spectrum. There are only two classes, advanced Sufi masters and ordinary people. Uh, we're all moving in a sense in a caravan on a road or a, a rising to heaven and the rungs of a ladder. This person is on a particular rung, some higher, some lower. But they're all, it, it, even people who are not of high spiritual character, such events can bring them to the spiritual life. Uh, I will give you a concrete example. The greatest tragedy that befell the Islamic world, or perhaps any civilization uh, that we know of, and that civilization survived is the Mongol invasion of the Islamic world. The great British historian of Islam, Sir Hamilton Gibb, always said that if the, if the Mongols had invaded Europe, European civilization would have been finished. But Islamic civilization survived. The devastation was unbelievable. My own country, Iran, demographers say that it lost half its population. Some 25 to 27 million people died. The great Iran of that time, great Persia of that time. Uh, but what did it bring with it? Devastation, yes. Death, yes. All of it, yes. But what did it bring with it? It first of all bring a remarkable re reflowering of Sufism. Great Sufi masses appeared everywhere. And a lot of people who, in ordinary times of worldly success, would have been attracted to the world, now turned towards the spiritual life. And we reached a golden age, really, of Sufi literature. One great master after another, one great master from Najmuddin uh, Kobra in Central Asia to Hafiz and uh, Shirat, of either poets or Sufi teachers or masters, and even Islamic art is revived the great Timur, the art comes after the Mughal invasion. Now, this, I'll give you this historical example, uh, because it's close enough for us to see the effects. You might, Attila might have done the same thing in Europe, but so far back, we don't have a historical consciousness really of what happens to European civilization after the uh, attack of Attila. But the historic one is later, and everyone knows about it. Uh, this can happen also individually for the human soul. Uh, and uh, when things are lost, when we put all of our eggs in one basket and the basket is taken away, we realize there's something amiss in us. Yes, it's painful, but because it also helps us to turn to the rest of us that we have forgotten, to the most precious part of our being, which had been willing to sacrifice to get up every morning to go to Wall Street and make six million dollars a year and come back in the evening. I'm just giving one example, each is on, each are off. But uh, you know what I mean. So uh, it should not be taken totally negatively. Uh, I mentioned for you this uh, very famous Islamic saying, Arabic saying, Al Khairu fi mawa'a. The good is in what occurs. I have something similar to that in, in Kabbalistic writing. Like I've read, I, I've loved the Kabbalistic writing. Uh, I've read the Zohar and many other things in my young days. Uh, uh, that is, 
You can't say if, if you walk in the street and a brick falls on your head from a building and cracks your skull, oh, how wonderful. That's how it is. But everything that occurs in life, we can learn from it. There's a khair in it. There's a, something good in it if we can learn from it. And on this macro scale, when we have this big uh, epidemic or a pandemic that is now sweeping all over the world, it's a very powerful, very, very powerful reminder of many truths that we have forgotten. The passing nature of the world, who we are, what is the meaning of life, or the chasing after ephemeral, what was it saying? It conditions a lot of very profound lessons. I would not doubt it that if, inshallah, we say in Arabic, if God wills, things settle down, that there will be a revival of not only spirituality in the theological sense, but in the manner of living more spiritually, of slowing down a little bit the haste that makes us all run so rapidly all the time. Uh, we think we're accomplishing so much, we're really running in circles. I hope that this will happen, and uh, I pray for that. I pray for that. I pray every day for all the people who are inflicted uh, by the disease that God gives them patience and gives them life and gives them fortitude to bear their pains. But uh, I also pray that this negative effect will have a positive, a negative cause will have a positive effect in a certain sense. There's also another point which is very important. All my life, since I was a young man, the training in both physics and philosophy, and I know something about modern science. I've been a great critic, not of modern science for what it is, but what it is not and claims to be. It is a totalitarian science of the world, and the only science acceptable, all other science of the world are illegitimate. The modern world that you might be able to publish books on the Kabbalah, but the modern world does not accept the Kabbalistic uh, uh, recent of reality as being part of knowledge, hard knowledge. It's, yes, it's interesting. The world is dominated by the materialistic, mechanistic worldview that began in the 17th century with the scientific revolution, the, all the transformations of electromagnetism in the 19th century, uh, uh, relativity, quantum mechanics, all those things that follow from it. Uh, it would be very good if you learned the lesson, uh, as I said before, of humility. This almighty science we could not uh, predict such a major event. And now, and now a few little bugs in a minute of an inch big are running havoc to all the mighty power of modern science and technology. This is a very important lesson for us to learn. Very, um, very important. It's funny you were, you were pointing to the Kabbalah. As I was listening to you and listening to some of the perspectives you shared, I realized that of the different interviews that I've conducted, the one with you echoes most closely that the one that I conducted with the Hasidic rabbi sitting in Safed, the city of the Kabbalists, who draws on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and so many of the quotes that you mention, he mentions, fleeing from God to God, uh, the notion of, uh, uh, you said something earlier that also reminded me totally of the whole sense of, of transient, transience of, 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 uh, uh, of the world, the opportunities for learning. It really struck me that so much, when people go to the dimension of religion, of spirituality, we discover some very great commonalities across the religions. You could almost take your words and put them into, into his mouth and vice versa. So I, I, I find that very fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. As the image has been used before me by a great scholar, Ananda Kumar Swami, who wrote an article called Paths That Lead to the Same Summit. Great religions of the world are a different path to the mountaintop. And at first, you start at different points in the valley. And you have different uh, countryside, different trees, different uh, hills. You think all the rivers are different. 
the higher you ascend, which means more inward, you will turn into, with the use of your religion, related to the inner dimension of the religion, the more do they approach each other until finally you realize there's only one one. So that, that actually leads me to my last question. So here are these different religions, and there are different points in the valley, but they come together. So in some ways, spiritually, they're interconnected by their meeting in the mountaintop. The world itself that we see today is also interconnected as we see geopolitically and as we see through the spread of this illness. The responses are interconnected. What, what is your spiritual theory, the background for understanding how everything is interconnected and how it plays out in this coronavirus situation? Uh, first of all, uh, I talk about myself personally, I don't talk about others. Others may have come to this truth to other ways. But I came to, to this truth through uh, awareness or becoming acquainted with uh, the philosophical premise, what's called the perennial flaw, the text of perennial philosophy, and it's exposed on defenders in the, in the modern world, the form of traditionalists, especially writings of Kumar Swami, Genon, Schwann, Burkhardt, people like that were writing in Europe in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s to try to show, in fact, this inner unity of religion. As soon as I ran across the literature, it appealed to me immediately. And I realized that if I believe that only Islam is true, how can I believe that God is also a Rahman and Rahim? How could not have compassion toward billion Chinese in Eastern Asia for 4,000 years. I put aside a few people in uh, Nanking who know about Islam in the 7th century. The rest of the Lord about Islam, before the revelation of Islam. All these Native Americans in North America, South America, the people of Africa and so forth and so on, people in Europe who had never heard of, of Islam. How could God be just Would to deny both the mercy and justice of God? So exclusivism, which is a natural thing, uh, it's a natural human thing, and God therefore permits it. Like you feel a sense of responsibility for your wife and children and family, and you love them, of course, not the way you love the children of about other people in the street of your <laughs> where you live, obviously. But uh, in religion, we, we must realize that all of this is part of human nature. But uh, human beings also must realize that the way you like your child, the father next door also loves his child. And therefore, this uh, attachment is not unique to you, it's universal. Now, this principle, which says there's ultimately only one truth, comes from one source of reality. It manifests itself in different societies through the wisdom of God according to the structure of those societies. When Lao Tse comes to China, he speaks Chinese, he doesn't speak Arabic. When uh, Daniel comes in Israel, he speaks Hebrew, and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, the prophet speaks Arabic, but although they speak different human languages, because God wanted this diversity. The Quran says, you create you differently so that you could buy with each other in witness. God's uh, creative power is so great, the reality is so great, that it could not be exhausted by just one race, one people, one language. And this diversity itself, therefore, is something positive. The Prenner for us has a lot to say about that. Once I discovered that, I, I, I felt to sit a remarkable peace. Since then, uh, 50 years, 60 years has passed. I've written God knows how many hundreds of articles, books on this subject, lectured in India and China, and the Islamic war in the West, uh, almost everywhere in the, uh, South America, Africa, Australia, I gave this Charles Strong lecture in Australia this on this very subject uh, in 1950, uh, in 1956, I remember forgotten when I was, uh, in the early 1960s. I'm getting old, I forget the dates. I don't forget the date of Abyssinia's death, but I will forget the age of my own life. I think, peop I think people, should, people should know how old you are. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But anyway, uh, uh, when I encountered this reality, I realized that uh, I said whether Lao Tse was speaking Chinese 
or Moses in Hebrew, or Christ in Aramaic, or the Prophet in Arabic, the Prophet of Islam, or for that matter, the great prophets of the North Indian Plains, of Indians who are speaking in their own language and so on. So about to, to your reason of mine, which are Semitic language, Abrahamic language, globally. That uh, the languages are different, but the meaning is the same. And I've lived by that all my life. Now, ordinary human beings in ordinary times do not have to bother with this truth. Our minds and our psyche was not made for that. But there were always exceptions. For example, when Islam, Judaism, and Christianity met in Spain, the close symbiosis where you had a different groups of different communities, even teaching each other, learning from each other, going to the same school, uh, uh, in, having intellectual discourse with Maimonides of Eros, on the primary neighbors of the same city of Cordoba. The, the Zohar appears in Spain. Uh, the Kabbalah uh, uh, the flowering and the language was also a lot of Sufism. There's also Jewish Sufism, but it's called Jewish Sufism. The grandson of my mother it was called Jewish Sufi. All these remarkable events took place, or in some place in India where Islam meets Hinduism. But it was an exception. It was an exception. Today, today we're living in exceptional times. And one exception deserves another. You are not. You are a Jew, I'm a Muslim. We are now talking together. Despite all the wars, the Palestinian, Israeli wars, all the tragedy, all the bitterness that has existed, nevertheless, when you and I look into each other's eyes and talk to each other, we really know we belong to the same universe. At least I feel that. We belong to the same universe. And it's time now to make that print of philosophy, which of course is not for everybody's intellectual structure of a very high order, but it's more practical in the sense of people of religion who speak about religion, to pay attention to the global reality of religion. Uh, yes, when you preach to uh, a few Jews as a rabbi or some Muslim preachers in the mosque or some if you're Muslim in a faraway place who've never met anybody else, uh, that's, you speak only about Judaism or only about Islam. But as uh, modernization grows, the other side of it is also the awareness of other cultures grows. Yeah, in, in, Islam, in the Islamic world, in Cairo, the ordinary person, uh, if you go to the mosque near Salah Hussein, he's ordinary Egyptian, if you talk about Lao Tse, or even Zoroaster, he doesn't know who they are. Of course, you know, the Abrahamic figures, Abraham, uh, Moses, and so on. But it would, outside the Abrahamic world, there's no religious talk. But if you just cross the Nile and come and give a lecture at the University of Cairo or uh, American University of Cairo or one of these universities, then the students, not only do they have a knowledge of some of the Muslims, but they also, whether they like it or not, they come to know other religions. And the more modernism is spreads, the more it is true. Here I have been teaching for over three decades now in the West, since I came into exile after the Iran Revolution. Uh, students who begin to take courses on religion, either uh, they have come from as a fundamentalist Southern families, very, very uh, exclusive uh, Protestantism. Uh, they they have are horrified that other religions, even within Christianity, not talking about Judaism and Islam, or Catholicism, Orthodox, and so forth, and they drop the course or something like that. Or they open up and realize that to be a good Christian, you also have now to learn about other religions. And I believe that the duty of those of us, like you and I, and people like us, who God has given the opportunity to have interactions. You are know, having this ratio with me. How do you choose me? I'm a Muslim to talk to. You chose it. I mean, to have had these interactions, to also think of God's grace. The Quran says His grace encompasses all things. Or His throne, His divine throne from which the grace descends. What's that course here? Uh, 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 to realize that, uh, to render service really to what is most dear to us in our heart, we must also respect the other. 
respect the other. And here, this word is perennial philosophy, which seems to be abstract, which deals all the, the very acute philosophical issues, also a very important practical uh, aspect. Let me conclude. Let me conclude. I'm going to finish. But give you an example. After the breakup of Yugoslavia, the country of Bosnia was created. Of course, there was Serbia, there was Croatia, one was Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, one was Catholic, and it was a terrible war that killed thousands and thousands of people. That's, do you remember that every 90s, a horrible war, was the worst war in Europe since the Second World War. And in Bosnia, uh, you have the majority of Muslim, but you also have Serbs who are Serbian Orthodox, you have also Catholics, and you have a, few, a small Jewish community that still survives the single war. I know some of them. They're very fine people. Now, uh, I'm in touch with a lot of their intellectual, spiritual leaders from all the different denominations. And in one place in Europe where they say the only choice we have to be able to live at peace together is to adopt the perennial philosophy as our national philosophy. If we say only the, uh, Muslims, what do you do with all the large minorities? If you say, oh, yes, we're already a Christian, and Muslims came in, 500 years old, let's fight, kick them out, we we'll lead to war. Uh, we have to be able to live together. And I, what are, the reason, in fact, for example, at this age, I accept your kind invitation, or invitation I'd like to speak, is because I feel this is such an important issue. It's not theoretical. It's a very, very important issue, and I hope and pray to God that this great tragedy that is now before us and we face in form of the coronavirus spread will lead us to a pasture, green pasture, where we realize that uh, we're all together. We're all in the same boat. And to bring at least somewhat greater harmony, I'm not... Uh, uh, wild eye uh, optimist uh, without reason, but uh, to bring some greater degree of harmony to us, to all of us, between, among ourselves. Secondly, for those who have thought that man is all power, powerful, to bring a sense of hubris and humility towards other human beings and to the whole of God's creation. And thirdly, to put modern science and technology more in its place as a science and a form of technology, but not as the totalitarian, dominating uh, way of knowing nature, which excludes everything else, and which cannot uh, predict something as big as this, as I told you before, or that MIT, a physics teacher always told us, that physics has to be able to predict. If physics cannot predict, it's not physics. Uh, so something as big as this that could not predict, that means we also should respect other forms of knowing. What Rabbi Ben Ezra was saying in the 13th century is still of value. Now that it's outmoded because of the scientific revolution, because they didn't know that galaxies were, how many galaxies there were in the uh, north or the south. And uh, I'm therefore, I will conclude the sentence, Hoping, inshallah, to say in Arabic, if God wills, that this difficult experience uh, will lead us, as I said, to a more meaningful, profound, and grounded life. In the conclude the verse of the Quran, with difficulty comes ease, inshallah. Difficulty comes ease. 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 Uh, I wanted I wanted to make two more comments on what you said. First of all, is that the uh, I'm sure you know him. He's a friend of his Grand Mufti uh, Mustafa Saric uh, from Bosnia. Uh, he, yes, he's a very good friend of mine. Well, he's part of the project. So uh, we'll, we we hear we hear in another one of the interviews in this series his perspective of things, and uh, uh, it's interesting to know that it's informed by the perennialist philosophy. The second point that occurs to me, and I don't know if this is wishful thinking or maybe this could be a vision of God, if following the Mongolian invasion of Iran, Sufism flourished, following the corona invasion of the world, 
interreligious and deep interhuman understanding will flourish? I'm almost certain that to some extent, uh, of course, there are impediments because uh, during the Mongol invasion, there had not been this long secularization of the Persian mind that uh, suddenly faced now the shaking of its world. Whereas uh, today, the modern world, especially in the West, uh, the secularization of the mind, the habit that everything can be solved through secular beings is more deeply rooted. But even that, the root is not that deep. And it will be shaken, let's hope. For better days. Anyway, I want to. Why don't you? Why don't you, you, and to thank you. Uh, why don't you conclude with a prayer to to this to this effect? All right. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. O God, give us what is good in this world and what is good in the other world. In this very difficult period of history gives us the strength to remember the reality of life, why we are here, why we have come here, and where we are going. To therefore love each other more, respect each other more, and extend this care not only to other human beings, but to the world of nature as well, to all the animals and plants, to all the mountains and seas which are also thy creation. I pray most of all that the openness of our heart to be able to see others across religious frontiers as not enemies but as friends, that even if they're not ours, that they are thine, and therefore they are our brothers and sisters. Without that, we cannot survive in a world in which contact now has become so close among various peoples from various regions and various continents. And finally, let us make us aware to, and to realize and to always remember that thou art the real ruler of the world, and that every event that takes place in this world has a meaning beyond its appearance and can be a means of growing closer to thy reality. Amen. Said Hussein Nasser, it may be 40 years since you were saluted at the airport. I salute you with deep gratitude and respect. Thank you very much. Wonderful to see you all. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing that on YouTube, not myself, but uh, friends will ask to have, a, to have a chance to see it. And I hope your program goes well. You keep well. God be with you.